morning, everybody. Uh, like John said, my name is Todd Boyland. I've been with RSTI uh, about 23, 24 years now. And I basically am the CEO of the training department and handle uh, curriculum development, instructor cross training, teach classes myself. I know I've seen a lot of you guys and gals at RSTI before, so it's good to see some uh, friendly faces. Who has not got a copy of this that just came in? <clears throat> so, knowing some of you guys that have been to some of my classes and seeing some friendly faces at RSTI, I expect a lot of uh, questions, interaction, feedback um, during this, so I, I'd appreciate that. Uh, this course, we could talk about this for two weeks because this is uh, obviously a two-week class that we teach at RSTI, Introduction to Servicing Radiographic and Fluoroscopic Systems, uh, which is basically the fundamentals of working on x-ray systems. And the beauty of this knowledge in this course is it applies, it's, it's fundamentals, they're going to apply all across the board when it comes to imaging equipment. If it makes x-rays, it's all going to rely on the same concepts. And I kind of use the analogy of an internal combustion engine. Every car needs air, it needs fuel, it needs spark. I don't care who made the engine, if it's internal combustion, the concepts still apply for Chevy, GM, BMW, Ford, <clears throat> you, you get the idea. So that's the beauty of this, is these are fundamentals that are going to apply across the board to any imaging system, whether it's a basic rad room, an RNF system, a CAF, Angio, IVR system, a CT. A lot of things we're talking about today are also going to be used in CT. That they're going to add another dimension of spinning and rotation and slippering power transfer, but the concepts are still going to be the same and still going to apply. So I think there's a remote here. How many people in here um, do some imaging now? How many have done uh, no imaging and do mostly biomed? Okay, so so a little bit, a little bit of both. Some um, transitioning into imaging. Some have done imaging, but uh, welcome and please stop me if there's any questions. So you have a handout which is has the slides numbered, and on you know, the bottom slide, uh, page one, slide two here. Uh, we get into Dr. Rankin, who was a German physicist in 1895, discovered x-rays by accident. Uh, he was actually doing experiments with vacuum tubes, and he was a photographer. So he happened to notice <clears throat> that he was applying high voltage across the vacuum tube with anode and cathode, and in his photography equipment, which was behind him, he was noticing them, these screens glowing and didn't know what was causing it. So x-rays are invisible. You can't see them. But he saw the screens glowing behind them and knew something was going on. Hence the name x-rays, like the x variable, like he didn't know what it was. It was an unnamed thing at the time. So in 1895, uh, x-rays were discovered by Dr. Rankin. Um, many images of the human body were, were acquired with zero regard to safety because, you know, 1896, the FDA wasn't around. We didn't have the regulations, and we just started using this stuff because, holy cow, I can see the inside of a person's body without cutting them open, which was a huge concept at the time because the only time you would see – the internals of somebody was during an autopsy, right? So to be able to see while they were still alive, what's going on inside their body was uh, was <clears throat> earth shattering. Won the Nobel Prize um, in 1901. That image right there is one of the first x-rays produced. That's actually of his wife. So you can see the ring up there um, on his wife's hand. <clears throat> she died of cancer, you know, a couple years later as a result of all the testing that was done on her. But if you come to RSTI, those of you who have been here before, we have a museum along the back of the walls, and there's an x-ray shoe fitter that was uh, came out of a store in Cleveland. Some of you guys might have seen this before on, like, um, American Pickers. You see them in, like, these old warehouses and stuff. It's a wooden box. It was an x-ray shoe fitter that was used in the 19, up until the 1940s to fit people's shoes. <clears throat> so Dr. Rankin discovered x-rays in 1895, and almost 50 years later, we're using them to fit our shoes. So think about that. 50 years went by before we really understood the implications and the impact of radiation, radiation safety, and those types of things. So it was widely implemented before we really had any understanding of what the implications were on our health and safety. This slide here, what are x-rays? X-rays are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, what are things that are part of the electromagnetic spectrum? <clears throat> you can see up here radio waves, microwaves, infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays, uh, visible light. Those are all within the range of the electromagnetic spectrum. In the top slide there, or the top of that picture, it shows like a soccer field, a baseball, red blood cell. That's showing the approximate size of the wavelength. And with the associated wave below it, 
obviously longer wavelength to the left, shorter wavelength to the right. What is this really showing? The shorter wavelength is going to have higher strength, higher penetrating ability. You know, X-rays and gamma rays can penetrate the human body, whereas obviously radio waves, microwaves, infrared, you know, light cannot. So it's just a demonstration that radiation is part of the spectrum of electromagnetic energy, just like visible light is. But visible light, like we can't see infrared. We can't see ultraviolet. Now there's, there's cameras that can do that, but our eyes are tuned to only see a very, very small narrow band in this spectrum. Radiation is also in the spectrum, but has a shorter wavelength, uh, higher energy photons. Because light is a photon, right? Radiation is a photon. The difference is the energy level that they have, okay? Uh, X-rays are high in frequency and low in wavelength. Uh, so you see on the right-hand side there, they have a high frequency, which means a really short wavelength, which means they're penetrating in nature, and they can pass through tissue, which makes them obviously useful for diagnostic imaging. Uh, this is a picture here of a basic uh, radiographic imaging room. Um, some of the big things we want to see in here is the x-ray generator, right? So you have a cabinet in the corner whose job is to take uh, alternating current, typically 480 volts AC from the customer at the wall, um, turn it into high voltage to pass across the x-ray tube. Um, this guy up in here holding the x-ray tube is called the OTS, overhead tube stand, that holds the x-ray tube uh, and carriage and columnar assembly to the ceiling. Obviously, we have the tube there and then the collimator. Uh, anybody know what the job of the collimator is? Yep, exactly. Radiation is just like light, photon. So radiation is given off in all directions, but we don't want to expose any more of the patient we have to. So we're gonna use a collimator to shrink the beam down only to the field of view, the area of interest that the customer, that the physician is interested in, okay? Uh, wall stand. What's this guy going to be used for? This wall stand over here. Anybody know? Chest shots. Yeah. So if they're going to do an AP or a PA chest, the the uh, patient is going to stand, you know, either facing the detector or facing the tube, depending if it's an AP or a PA, uh, for a chest shot, and that can be moved vertically as well. And then inside the table, there's an image receptor inside here as well that they'll do extremities and see the studies and and things like that. So this basic radiographic room has one x-ray tube and has the potential of two detectors. Now every room is going to have two detectors. You'll see some rooms that are wall stand only, in which case they'll bring a wall stand in and it can typically go into a uh, 90 or a zero and they can do chest shots or roll a stretcher in. So they can lay the detector flat and do stretcher shots on there. Uh, some rooms only have tables. They might only do peds and general x-ray and not do chest shots and not have a, a wall stand, have only a table. Some of these tables are elevating. This one, this is a Shimatsu table, is elevating. The table moves up and down. It also floats. Um, yeah. And what's not shown in here is the control console, obviously where the operator is going to sit and control the techniques, pull the, you know, load the patient work list, look at the images, things like that. I talked before about the basic radiographic imaging room and from the standpoint of the fundamentals apply across the board. So really any x-ray system, what we teach in phase one can be broken down into three basic areas. I would say the production of x-rays is one of the areas, the formation of the image, and finally image receptor image processing. So in the production of x-rays, what are we doing in there? We're selecting technique, the computer's controlling the generator and actually producing the radiation. See how the x-ray tube is actually part of the production of x-rays? Formation of the image, what am I doing there? I'm collimating the beam down only to the appropriate area, making sure I hit the detector in the right spot. I'm using um, grids to decrease scatter and increase contrast, which we'll get to in a little bit, but we're forming the image. <clears throat> now that the image has been formed, I have to capture it and display it. So those are kind of the three main areas. In any troubleshooting that we do in life, the idea is to start cutting the problem in half, right? I want to know, is this problem, is this a machine, hey, I have no image. Well, it could be because the generator isn't producing x-rays. It could be because the detector isn't seeing the image. So it's helpful in any troubleshooting 
to take and understand the subsystems and be able to break it down into these working subsystems. Any questions about that? No. <clears throat> so this slide here, this is more advanced. So I would say we want to start with this. I want to think of any X-ray system of producing X-rays, forming the image, and then the image receptor and processing. Once we understand that concept, I teach mostly cath labs and CT. So I like to break my systems down, the more advanced systems, into these three subsystems. X-ray generation, image detection, and geometry. Because your basic rad room, which is really what this presentation is about, doesn't have a lot of geometry. What do I mean by geometry? Anybody know what I'm referring to there? Um, table movements, um, OTS movements, overhead tube stand movements, which in a rad room could be manual, right? They grab the brakes, they walk it over, put in the position. The, your modern systems, they hold the button down and it auto positions the tube and the table to the appropriate spot. When you start getting into things like um, cath labs, angio, the table's gonna tilt, it's gonna move vertically, it's gonna move laterally, it's gonna roll cradle. The stand and C-arm is gonna do this. Those are all the geometry type movements. So for a basic, basic rad room, I probably shouldn't even put that slide in there. It's more like advanced kind of cath angio stuff. But the whole point is understanding these systems as subsystems. Is it making x-rays? Is it capturing the x-rays? Is it displaying the x-rays? Is it a movement problem? Those are all the things we're trying to break the systems down into for troubleshooting purposes. Good question. <clears throat> How are x-rays produced? So what we have here is a pretty simplified diagram of an x-ray generator. <clears throat> and an x-ray tube, it's obviously not quite this simple, but the x-ray tube is a vacuum, and we're gonna just talk for a second about identifying and labeling different components of this really simplified x-ray diagram. Uh, does anybody know where the anode would be? Which letter would be the anode in this diagram? Anybody? B. <clears throat> so if you were to label this, the anode is the B, also called the rotor, it's on the stator side. So letter B is the anode of the tube. Where's the cathode? Cathode is A, which is also your, where your filaments are. So you have an anode and a cathode, which are B and A. KV minus and KV plus. What's KV stand for? Anybody know? Kilovolts. It's a, it's a voltage, right? But thousands of volts. We're measuring a potential across anode and cathode. And the reason we're applying the potential across here is because that's how we're gonna pull tube current across to create radiation, okay? If we don't have KV, you're not gonna make any X-rays. So what we first have to do is to apply high voltage between the anode and cathode. Uh, so KV minus, which one is going to be the minus side, KV? <clears throat> What's that? A? <clears throat> A, yes. So the, exactly, the filaments, are going to be the cathode is going to be negative so a in this diagram is going to be your um kv negative well there by process of elimination then kv positive is going to be b the anode because what directions do electrons want to flow from what to what <clears throat> negative to positive okay so what we're doing here is we are applying a high voltage across a and b to get electrons oops to get electrons to want to slam into the anode to create the radiation. So a typical KV you'll see used is 80 KV, 80,000 volts. That means there's 80,000 volts of potential between A and B in this case. So what would you typically expect the voltage to be at A? Anybody know? On an 80 KV exposure? Negative 40,000. The volt, and this is just an example, right, for 80 kV. So A would be negative 40,000 volts, and B would be positive 40,000 volts because it's just potential. So negative 40 to positive 40 gives you 80,000 volts of potential. Some manufacturers, um, usually you see it in places like mammography, where it's lower kV, will have the anode grounded and apply all the kV on the cathode side, but always the cathode is more negative than the anode. So we can have current flow between the cathode and the anode. Which explains why in the high voltage tank here, I have the high voltage transformer 
and a filament transformer. Why does the filament transformer need to be in a high voltage tank? Because it's at negative 40,000 volts, right? In the anode side, it's going to be a positive 40,000 volts. <clears throat> so the 80 kV example I just used, negative kV would be then A, it would be minus 40 kV, and B would be positive 40 kV for that example. If it was 100 kV exposure, it'd be negative 50 and positive 50 kV, you get the idea. Uh, the next one to identify says kV total. What's that going to be up there? Yeah, between the difference between A and B, exactly. So like the example we just gave, minus 40 and positive 40, the kV total will be 80 kV in that example. <clears throat> filament current. What is filament current referring to? We know what that is. Well, judging by the name, it's current flowing through where? The filament. Yeah, it's it's really the current flowing through here, right? So it's the. Let's see, how would we? Yeah, it's probably the current flowing through C. I guess is how you would describe that. Yeah, it's the loop of current flowing through C in this case. And make a note for filament current. We typically see amps of filament current. Two amps, three amps, four amps is pretty typical amounts of current you're going to see flowing through a filament. And that filament's in the cathode, letter A. If you were to look at it, what does it look like? It's a little tungsten wire, right? Where did we see tungsten wires? Not anymore, but <clears throat> light bulbs, right? Your, your, your regular light bulbs from 15, 20, 30 years ago were just filaments running amps of current through that filament. When you run current through a, a tungsten filament, what's it do? It gives off light. <clears throat> Heats up, it gives off heat, and gives off light. You know, it gives off photon energy. <clears throat> but think about this for a second now that this is lighting up. There's electrons that are floating on and around this tungsten filament, this light bulb. We look at a light bulb lit up, there's electron flowing through there. That's your filament current. Nothing is going across from A to B without KV, though. KV is what's going to suck those electrons across and slam them into the anode, <clears throat> which brings us to the next point here, tube current. So if filament current is the current flowing through the filament, the C loop in this case, what's tube current then? It's the amount of current going between what? Yes, it's electrons that flow between A and B. Why do electrons want to go from A to B? They're just floating in space. These electrons are floating around a tungsten filament. Why do they want to go from A to B? Because the, the potential. Okay. If you have electrons flowing through A, at negative 40,000 volts, and you have B this far away at positive 40,000 volts, there's 80,000 volts that want to suck these electrons across the tube. Does that kind of make sense? You you don't have radio, you don't have tube current without filament current. You also don't have tube current without KV. Right, you can light a light bulb and just have it run filament current through there and have no radiation given off. I can apply high voltage or KV across there with no filament current. I will still have no KV, no no tube current. So it's a combination of the two. It's the potential difference between here and here and the KV, the filament current running through here in amps, and that creates tube current in milliamps running through between the cathode and the anode. <clears throat> so at that point, between A and B, are those photons or electrons? Still electrons, right? We, we still have electrons flowing through the filament that we're now sucking across the tube, and they're still electrons, okay? Well, in a minute, we're going to get into where the photons are created, but by process of elimination, you can probably decide that, you know, letter E, basically photons are going to be anything down in here, okay? The radiation is going to be produced at the anode which is B in our case, and it's going to be as a result of the 
high speed, high energy interaction of electrons striking the anode. Anybody have any questions here? Questions, comments? Yes, sir. Yes. I don't really have a good letter for filament current. Just make a note. It's the current in amps flowing through the filament. So if you were to draw, um, it's this loop. Right? Is, there's current flowing through there. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not going to have any current flowing through D until you have KV, tube current. You're right. We will have current flowing here, but only when radiation and when, when tube current is happening. Does that make sense? So that tube current has to go somewhere. This is filament current. We suck it across. Now what's it doing? It's going back through here. And this is a very simplified diagram. There's going to be electronics, monitoring feed, you know, checking cur uh, tube current levels and MA levels and things like that. But just the, the big picture items are filament current is amps of current flowing through the filament like a light bulb. And tube current is what flows between the cathode to the anode. Again, we're still talking electrons here. We haven't produced any radiation yet, right? Good question. Other questions? So now how are we going to create x-rays? X-rays are created, what slide number is this? This is number uh, seven. So x-rays are created by the decelerating of electrons in the anode material. So Here's the anode, right? Here's the cathode. So filament current, KV, tube current. And this little diagram here shows actual uh, atoms that make up the target material, the anode material. Does anybody know what typical material you'd see used in an anode? Tungsten. Yeah, tungsten is most common. The atomic number is, uh, I think, 78, something like that, um, which means it's very dense. Very dense, uh, very hard material, very heavy. If you pick up a piece of tungsten, even a small piece, it's very heavy, you know, kind of like lead, not quite that heavy, but <clears throat> other materials you might see used in an anode, uh, molybdenum, um, rhodium, but those are mostly for mammography because they're used at lower KV levels. So tungsten is the material we're using here, mostly for its heat handling cap capabilities because all these electrons being slammed into the anode are gonna create a ton of heat. Uh, in fact, this process here is extremely inefficient. It's about 99% heat in 1% x-rays, you know, an estimate. Very inefficient. X-ray tubes are not very good at creating radiation. They make a lot of heat and a little bit of x-rays. <clears throat> but what's actually happening here is these electrons that we pulled across here, which is tube current, are slamming into the anode with such force, they're actually knocking electrons out of orbit in each atom. And we'll go into the next slide and kind of explain what's happening there. But this is where the radiation is actually being produced by electrons slamming into the anode with enough force that it gives off radiation. <clears throat> um, the, the first one we talk about Bremster lung, and these are, you know, you don't really, these are academic. This doesn't really help you service an x ray machine, but when someone says Bremster lung radiation, Bremster lung is the German word for breaking. So if you look at this example here, this diagram shows the path of an incident electron. It didn't actually interact with any of the electrons around the nucleus. But think of this like gravity. Each atom is held together, this is back to kind of high school chemistry class, I guess, but each atom is held together by different shells, K shells, L shells, N shells. But the different shells are energy that hold electrons in orbit at a certain distance. So this electron here, it's kind of like if you slingshot something past the Earth or Moon, it's going to be affected by gravity. So by changing direction here, this interaction to the nucleus, a photon is given off. So there was no interaction between electrons, but it actually went so close to the nucleus, it turned it. 
and by turning it, we have to give off energy, and the energy is in the form of radiation. Okay, so Bremsstrahlung energy, Bremsstrahlung radiation is given off when those electrons slam with such force, they curve around uh, the nucleus of an atom and give off radiation. <clears throat> this slide here is called characteristic radiation. This is when the electron actually collides or hits another orbital electron. So there's a certain binding energy on this shell. The first shell is called your K shell, and that binding energy holds the two electrons in its shell. The K shell has two electrons. Well, if one electron knocks an electron out of the K shell, what's gonna happen? This energy, this binding energy, is gonna suck the other electrons, the outer shells, down to fill that void. That transfer of energy is radiation being given off. Again, it's not a chemistry class, it doesn't really matter, but the electron slam with such force into the anode, they're actually interacting at the atomic level and giving off energy in the form of radiation. The orbital electron in this case is ejected from the shell and the filling of the vacancy from the next shell down gives off photon energy. <clears throat> Does that kind of make sense? Clear as mud? Any questions about that? And then different materials have different binding energies. You know, tungsten, we talked about before, mostly being used in the anode material. It's, it's um, binding energy 69.5 uh, keV, kilo electron volts. Molybdenum is 20 kVe or keV, kilo electron volts. So the different types of materials have different amounts of energy holding the electron, the atoms together, and therefore giving off different levels of radiation. So I mentioned before, like we use molybdenum and rhodium mostly in mammal. Why is that the case? Because it's lower KV levels, softer tissue, right? The breast is made up of adipose tissue, glandular tissue, and fibrous tissue. There's no bones, there's not much contrast. So we lower KV, lower levels of radiation, thermography. Questions, comments? <clears throat> Okay, this slide number is this one here, showing the x-ray tube, slide 10, page 5. <clears throat> and again, we're applying, applying high voltage across the anode and cathode. And what we're showing here is what's called the focal spot. So the focal spot is the actual point of radiation. So this thick blue line here, where it says actual, is that electrons or photons? This is electrons, right? This is tube current. Those are electrons. This blue line here is going to be photons. That's radiation given off. Okay. Where uh, the actual? I just want to make clear that this is electrons. We have the interaction we just talked about a minute ago where the electrons collide and give off radiation. So this projected line here is photons or x-rays or radiation. <clears throat> this picture isn't really that accurate though um, because what, um, in what direction would radiation be given off? All directions, right? Think of your filament light bulb. You turn that light bulb on, where do the light photons go? Everywhere. You can't control them. They go every direction. The x-ray tube is no different. We're going to talk in a minute how we shape that, you know, with the port of the tube and the collimator, but the x-ray tube is entirely lead lined and only allows radiation out of the port. So the radiation gives it a shape, or the, the tube gives it its shape coming out of the port, and then we're going to use the collimator to further um, collimate the beam down to the size. I just want to be clear that it's not really like we're not steering these things like a you know a CRT tube. They're given off all directions. Any questions here? <laughs> all right. So this slide here, we're going to use terms to um, quantity and quality to describe radiation production. You know, quality is a um, going to refer to how strong the photon energy is, 
and quantity is going to refer to how many photons are given off. So you're going to hear terms of kV, ma, and time. kV obviously is referring to what again? Tube potential between anode and cathode. ma is referring to tube current between anode and cathode. And time is just referring to how long you are going to be applying that for, how long the exposure is. Okay. So what this diagram is showing is that kV, ma, and time are going to affect the, the image differently. Why does kV affect the quality of the beam? Quality meaning the penetrating ability. If you have an X-ray photon at 40 kV versus 80 kV versus 120 kV, obviously the 120 kV photon has more energy. Okay. I'm kind of out of order here, but what the X-ray photons can do three things in the body. Anybody know what they can do? They can penetrate, which means they went right through your body. They can absorb. The tissue actually stopped the photon energy and absorbed it, and they can scatter, go off in a different direction. Okay. If you increase the KV, what's that going to do to the photon energy? Increase it, which means more likely to penetrate less likely to absorb. Everything in imaging is a balance between penetration and absorption. It's kind of backwards though, because you would think that 100 kV is more dangerous to the patient than 60 kV, but it's not. Why is 100 kV actually going to be a lower dose to the patient than let's say 60 kV? It's less likely to be absorbed. Exactly. Because everything can penetrate or absorb. If you have a higher level photon, it's more likely to what? Penetrate and not be absorbed. What causes dose to the patient? Absorption. It's when your body stops those photons. You're absorbing the energy. That's what causes dose to the patient. It's a hard concept to grasp, but penetration means the photon went through your body and didn't interact with anything. Think about that. It's like shining a light through your body, but didn't touch any cells. It's a crazy concept to think about, but it has such high energy, it didn't interact with a single atom in your body. It went right through the detector to be turned into an image. <clears throat> so it makes sense, I hope, that KV affects quality of the beam. Higher energy, higher quality photons, which change the penetration absorption. <clears throat> They're also going to change the quantity. I'm going to go back for a second. <clears throat> if I left everything else constant in this diagram here, but I increase the KV, what would happen? Think about that for a second. Filament current remains the same, but I increase the KV. Tube current increases. Tube current increases. Yeah, everybody understand that? If you have three amps of filament current at 80 kV, it's going to suck a certain amount of electrons across. If you keep three amps of filament current, but go to 120 kV, there's more force. It's going to pull more of those electrons across. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So that's what this slide here is talking about. Changing the kV will affect the quality. It'll affect your penetration. It'll affect your absorption. It'll affect your contrast. It will also affect your quantity. It will increase or change the number of electrons being sucked across because of that difference in potential, difference in KV. Is that confusing? Does that kind of make sense? <clears throat> the, um, MA and time, these are a little bit easier. If you change the MA, you haven't, in other words, you went from 100 milliamps of current to 200 milliamps of current. Have you changed the energy flowing between here and here? You haven't changed the energy. You've changed the quantity. You have more current, but it's not any more powerful. So that those photons are not going to penetrate any more or less or be absorbed any more or less. So by changing the MA, what's it going to do to the image? Lighter or darker? <clears throat> it's only going to add, qu add quantity or number of photons. It's not going to make it penetrate more. 
It's not going to make it penetrate less or absorb. It's only going to affect the number of photons produced. And therefore, time is really the same thing as well. If you had the same same KV, same MA, but took the exposure for a longer period of time, you have more quantity. It doesn't change the contrast, doesn't change penetration, doesn't change absorption, doesn't change the energy level or the quality of the beam at all. It just changes the number. <clears throat> Why do doctors care about this stuff? Um, because uh, I gave the example before about mammography. Mammo is soft tissue. So what kind of KVs are you going to be using in mammal? Really lower. Because if you try and use 80 KV in mammal, everything penetrates. Nothing absorbs. What's your image look like? Completely black. There's no contrast there. Okay. Same thing if you try and shoot a sternum chest shot at 30 KV. Everything's absorbed. Nothing penetrates. What's your image look like? Just white, washed out. So all this imaging we're doing here is a balance of penetration and absorption, and these are the factors that are going to change um, how much penetration there is, the length of time, all factors are going to change the quality of the beam and the quantity of the beam. <clears throat> so there's a lot going on in this slide, but in summary, the, the three technique factors that the customer can control are KV, MA, and time, and they are going to impact the image quality differently by making it lighter or darker. Uh, more penetration, less of, less penetration, more absorption, less absorption. <clears throat> that's, that's a lot to digest there, but that's kind of the, the gist of it. And, and nowadays, nobody picks a technique, right? Nobody walks up to a machine and says, I want this KV, this MA, and this time. How come? <clears throat> it's all automatic, right? It's, it's all automated into a, a process called AEC, Automatic Exposure Control, where the customer picks a chest or an extremity, or a head, or a sternum. And the system is automatically going to determine the KV and then shut off the exposure at the appropriate time. This slide here, x-ray tube insert and rotor. <clears throat> so the anode, again, is the target material. We talked about this. There's your cathode, not shown here. The rotor is the, the actual shaft or kind of axle that the anode spins on. And the stator is an electromagnetic, um, it's an electric motor. So you have stator windings. You're going to run current through the stator windings, and they're basically going to get the anode to spin at you know 6,000 RPM to 10,000 RPM, depending on, on the tube. Why? You don't have to spin the rotor to make x-rays. But why do we do it? <clears throat> heat yeah you want that that focal spot if it didn't move we said before how inefficient x-rays are it's a lot of heat and not much radiation if you don't spin the anode it's going to burn the tungsten so we're literally spin the anode to dissipate that heat over a wider area <clears throat> you know so that's a smaller anode right there it's about this big around that's a general x-ray you look at a cath cath lab angio this going to be you know anode this big around ct this big around because you got to handle a lot more heat <clears throat> for longer periods of time. But inside this is a vacuum, which everybody I'm sure is aware, right? So there's, I mean, there's no oxygen, no air molecules inside there. In fact, has anybody ever seen a light bulb turned on with a, with a cracked, cracked glass envelope? What happens? Your light bulbs are a vacuum too, right? It starts on fire. Yeah. Tungsten, when it's exposed to oxygen, it's literally just going to burn up. So the x-ray tube is inside a vacuum for the exact same reason. It'll catch on fire and, and burn up in instant. Because these, these tungsten filaments are very brittle. I mean, there's not much to them. What's an x-ray tube cost? Anybody know? <clears throat> as low as 10 grand up to 150 grand. You know, your, your portable uh, or your mammography tube, you know, Hologic sells their tubes for about 12 or 13K. Um, new, uh, you can probably get some, you know, MX 100s, pretty generic X-ray tubes used by GE Rad Rooms for five to 10K. Your CT cath angio tubes are going to be 150 to 200,000. <clears throat> it's expensive light bulb. That's exactly what it is. It's a very, very expensive light bulb. <clears throat> 
Uh, this slide here, this looks like slide number, what is this one, Eddie? 13. 13. <clears throat> so this goes back to what I was saying before about x-rays being given off in all directions. We can't control where radiation is given off. It's just like a light bulb. It's going off all directions. So why don't we have radiation all throughout the room? Because the actual x-ray tube insert is inside of a lead lining. So the x-ray tube is entirely lead lined. There's a circular port right here. So the radiation coming out of the port is going to be in a cylindrical shape, okay? How does the beam get shaped down to a square or rectangle then? The collimator. So the collimator will be after the port and further shape the beam down to the, the size and area we're looking at. So this is just showing the difference between um, you know, housing and the actual insert. We're gonna talk about filtration. Uh, we're gonna use filters, which can be mostly aluminum uh, or copper. And the reason why filters are used in imaging systems is for patient safety and FDA compliance, because we're required to have filtration. Um, but when a, a physician's talking about 80 kV exposure, what's the kV stand for again? Kilovolts, thousands of volts. It's technically kVp kilovolts peak. So when you talk about 80 kVp exposure, what's the P mean? The peak. That's the max. So in an 80 kVp exposure, not every photon is going to be 80 kV. Some will be 74. Some will be 60. Some will be 50. Majority up around 80, but the peak tells you that's the highest energy given off in there. But we don't really want energy below the peak because if you want 80 kV exposure, What's, happen, what's gonna happen if a lot of other photons are given off at lower energies? It's less penetration and more absorption. It's gonna increase patient dose and it's gonna change your image quality. So we use what are called filters. So filters are sheets of aluminum or copper. Um, they could be fractions of a millimeter thick. They can be copper, actually there's copper, Gold, silver, and aluminum are the four materials that are used. And they can be like foil thickness, like literally, you know, aluminum foil where if you touch it with a tool, you'll, you'll blow right through it. So you want to be really careful in handling these. They can also be corrosive. So you don't want to touch them to get like oils and stuff on them because that over time can cause corrosion and artifacts to the image. Um, but by adding a filter, aluminum filter in this area or the, the collimator, what's that going to do to the beam? What's it filtering out? the lower energies. We just said before that KVP is the peak, the highest energy. So we're gonna add filtration and it's gonna filter out the lower energy photons, which would have been absorbed by the patient. That makes sense, <clears throat> okay? So how does adding filtration increase patient safety? Yeah, less is absorbed which means lower, you're reducing the patient dose, exactly. <clears throat> it's a lower energy stuff that is not of value because it's absorbed by the patient, it's increasing dose, and isn't providing to the image quality I want, to give me the contrast that I want. So um, <clears throat> the, those are used for patient safety. Your modern collimators are automated, where for different techniques, there's little motors, servo motors that'll bring in different thicknesses of aluminum and copper and gold, and they'll actually bring them in on a little disc or something like that, um, depending on what the operator selects for a technique. <clears throat> There's also a requirement for filtration. Um, the, the half value layer has to be above 2.9 millimeters, 80 kV. I don't wanna go too crazy here, but <clears throat> HVL, half value layer. Uh, this is the concept you'll hear used by physicists. Um, I don't really have a slide on it, but does anybody know what half value layer is? What's that? Mm -hmm. Yes, the physicists want to know how much aluminum it would take to cut this beam in half. So if I took an exposure right now, I would put a meter in there, a dosimeter, which measures radiation. I would take an exposure at 80 kV. And I would measure the total amount of radiation. 
So radiation, um, the units you'll hear used are um, grays in Europe, grays, nano grays, milli grays, or Rankins in the US, MR or R for, for Rankins. So if you took an exposure and you had 500 MR milli Rankins of exposure with nothing in the beam, I would keep adding aluminum above my meter, here's my meter, I would keep adding aluminum until my value gets to be what? 250. I measured 500 with nothing in there. So now I'm going to keep adding aluminum until I measure 250. That is the amount of aluminum it took to cut this beam in half, hence the name half value layer. Okay. If you have your half value layer, a higher half value layer, what's it tell you about your beam? Higher energy. So this is a hard concept to grasp. But if it takes more aluminum to cut that in half, it was a higher energy to start with. Okay, so half value layer, there's a minimum. The physicists have to check this at 80 kV, actually many kVs, but the requirement at 80 kV is 2.9 millimeters of aluminum or above. And if it passes at install, it'll never fail. You may know why. Because HVL over time only does what? <clears throat> Goes up. Okay. So, and the reason why that is, going back to this slide right here, you can't really see it, but there in, that, in the glass envelope, there's a layer of tungsten inside the tube that happens because there's so much heat given off here, tungsten actually splashes and creates. Uh, a tungsten envelope on the window with all that heat. What is that tungsten on the glass acting like? Additional, Additional filter, right? This tungsten, it's like putting aluminum foil right here. Over time, as that tungsten builds up, the tungsten gets thicker and thicker, which means the beam gets harder and harder and harder, which means my half value layer <clears throat> So that's why I said you will never, if you see a HVL fail, it'll only be a new tube. It'll never fail after that because it only is going to increase beyond that. <clears throat> so in summary, what is half value layer? It's a measure of beam hardness. A low half value layer tells you it's soft radiation, a lot of absorption, not much penetration. A high half value layer is lots of penetration, less absorption. <clears throat> What does the doctor want for patient dose? Absorption or penetration? Pen yeah, higher penetration means lower patient dose. <clears throat> but it can't be too high because you need contrast. So it's always a balance. Everybody wants low dose images and high quality. You can't have your cake and it too. It's one or the other. Right? You got to have some absorbed dose to give you good contrast to see what's going on in the, in the image. What's this go to, uh, this first section? session? Ten more minutes? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions about filters? What they are? Why we do them? <clears throat> uh, we mentioned briefly about collimators. And uh, this is just showing you how the collimator hooks onto the x-ray tube. And you can see the light source on the side. When the technologist walks up and hits the collimator light, it shines a light bulb into the area, there's no radiation there, right? It's just light. <coughs> Excuse me. But what's the advantage of the light coming out of the collimator? It, yeah, it shows the technologist this is where radiation is going to fall. So it's important as service engineers, when we calibrate this, we're going to make adjustments so that where the light bulb falls, if, if this was the exact size of the light, I don't want my radiation over here. It needs to be in the exact same spot. So that's an adjustment or check we will have to do to make sure that the light source is congruent to the radiation or x-ray field. <clears throat> so you can see here the collimator has a you know, light bulb with a mirror and just shining down where the radiation will project. Um, the two options for collimation are manual, meaning the customer takes the two knobs, they turn the knobs of the collimator and it changes the blades and they move in X and Y. The other option, you'll hear uh, the term PBL, positive beam limitation. The system will automatically adjust the collimator based on the what's called the SID, 
which we'll get to shortly. So as they move the comet up and down, if you didn't change the size, if you increase, if you increase the distance, what's going to happen? Right? It's a bigger area. Here's a here's a these are light photons. If you increase that distance, they're going to cover a larger area. So what PBL, the positive beam limitation, will do is it would change the shape of this light, no matter where it falls, to make sure it hits the detector appropriately. If that makes sense. <clears throat> uh, this is a YouTube video. Uh, it's on a YouTube channel that I took. This is a calf angio, so it's a little bit more advanced. But you can see the collimator blades here moving, right? Closing in this direction. That's the video resulting. Blades closing this way, the resulting video. <clears throat> and this is a more advanced feature of a calf angio collimator. Those are wedges. So what a wedge, have you heard that term before, wedge filter? A wedge filter would be like in a cath lab, if you were doing a leg, for example there would be a lot of radiation on the detector, but not much radiation uh, in the patient, which would give you a lot of contrast and it washes the image out. They'll take those wedges and they'll steer them around the anatomy to give you a, a more homogeneous grayscale image. So those are also inside of the collimator. You won't see them in a regular x-ray room. It's more for fluoro, cath labs, and angio, but something else that can go wrong in a collimator. You got these collimator blades that move, you got filters that move in and out, and you got these wedges. And the cal there's really no calibration for these. Either they work or they don't. You know, if you have a collimator problem, guess what you're gonna do? Place a collimator. If your wedge is stuck, place a collimator. There's not much you can do uh, inside these things. And these collimators can range from, you know, a couple thousand up to 20, 30, 40,000 for your cast and CT and stuff as well. <clears throat> What's that? Um, I can't tell from this. I can tell my distance and the angle, but the screen doesn't tell. <clears throat> uh, 90, 100, 110. Because most of the time we're doing like blood work like that using a, a contrast agent, like iodine. <clears throat> exactly, because you can't see blood flow, right, in, in a regular um, video. But the contrast injected, which is iodine, goes through the bloodstream, and now that is, the iodine is radio opaque, so it's absorbing the radiation. That gives you your contrast. So you'd see that's when you see like a um, an image of just blood vessels. How they do that? They're using contrast to do that. Yeah, good, good question. <clears throat> um, compared to barium, is used for GI. So how does barium get into your body? You drink it, right? And it coats the inside of your, your GI like a pepto commercial, right? How does iodine get into there and inject it to the, to the bloodstream? Yeah, good question. We've already kind of touched on this topic here, but this is slide number, what is this one? 17, this, the summary, uh, page nine, the summary here is um, what, what, is, what do x-rays do? They penetrate, they absorb, and they scatter, okay? Penetration means that photons went right through the body and didn't interact. Absorption, it was absorbed by the tissue and retained as patient dose. What does scatter mean? We haven't really talked about this yet. Yeah, the photon changes direction, just like the electrons did in the atoms of the anode. So why is scatter really bad then? It distorts the image because now I have photons that aren't giving me an accurate depiction of the anatomy. And I'm increasing patient dose. So that dose now goes into the patient and I can't use the image. So it's really, really bad. So we want to do whatever we can to minimize scatter. What tools are we going to use to minimize scatter? We know what they're called? <laughs> Grids, right? So we're going to use a grid. So this picture here is a grid. X-ray photons are not the primary path. And again, they can um, re increase dose without improving the, the image quality. Where is this grid located, though? <clears throat> 
<clears throat> yep, detector, x-ray tube, and patient. The grid has to be down here. It's after the interaction with the tissue. Does that make sense? Okay. So what is the grid then? It's a it's a thin, um, you know, they're probably about like this thick. It covers the size of the detector, and what's inside of it is a bunch of little lead lines, vertically like this. So what are those vertical lines going to do? They're going to allow primary photons through, and they're going to block anything that comes at an angle that's not perpendicular. So the grid is going to absorb that scatter radiation. <clears throat> that make sense? And they're actually not perpendicular. You'll see here that they're kind of pointed towards the middle because they're for a range of distances. So you have to change the grid if, the, if they want to use a different distance because they're actually focused to a point to allow those primary photons through. Think about the impact of using a grid then if you took an exposure with a grid and without the grid, what would what would the impact of be on the image and the dose of the patient and things like that? By by adding a grid, what has to happen to your KVMA and time technique now? I have to increase it. How come? Mm -hmm. The grid is filtering out some of those you know those photons, so I therefore have to use a higher technique which actually means more dose to the patient, if you think about it. So it's improved image quality because I'm gonna have improved contrast, but I'm gonna have a little bit of patient dose increase, like what I said before, it's trade-off. If you wanna increase in image quality, there's gonna be a, a trade-off. No free lunch, right? <laughs>